What can we learn when we reflect on these case studies of people who suffer from dementia and their family caretakers? Is dementia a disease that you catch that one day may be magically cured? Or is dementia a condition that is an extreme case of cognitive decline that we all experience as we approach our 60s and 70s? Why are the dysfunctions of relationships between the dementia patients and their family caretakers enhanced and aggravated by the cognitive decline of the accompanying dementia? Why do caretakers so often tussle with their loved ones who suffer from dementia when they know that their dementia has robbed them of their short-term memory? Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. Please feel free to follow along in the PowerPoint script we uploaded to SlideShare. Why is the book, Travelers to Unimaginable Lands, needed? Norman Doidge, who wrote the foreword, explains, none of the mainstream drugs for dementia disorders does much to reverse cognitive decline, except to offer a few months of lessening symptoms. There will be no magical cures. His argument is that the idea that Alzheimer's is caused by excessive amyloid plaques in the brain is woefully inadequate to explain the disease. It's more complicated than that. Now, although dementia cases caused by drugs, dehydration, or vitamin deficiencies are sometimes reversible, those dementia cases caused by cognitive decline are irreversible. Usually, treatments for neurological conditions in general can only delay the decline. They cannot reverse the decline. In any of our videos on dementia, we feature celebrities who suffered from this condition. Margaret Thatcher and Sean Connery were diagnosed a few years before their departure. Thatcher died at 87 and Sean Connery died at 90. Now, Ronald Reagan had a long and productive life. He was 70 when his two terms in office began. Early in his presidency, he survived an assassination attempt where he was shot in the lungs and nearly died. Whether this was one trigger for his eventual Alzheimer's is anybody's guess. Five years after his presidency, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and he passed away 10 years later. Many of his political opponents speculate whether Reagan displayed signs during his last years as president. All attending physicians affirmatively deny this. But one theme of the book we will be reviewing today paints a different picture. A picture where dementia does not just one day happen to the patient, but where rather someone's compromised behavior slowly evolves and transitions from their normal behavior. So it is really pointless to even to speculate on such questions, as no good can come from it. To clarify, there are many types of dementia, but Alzheimer's patients comprise over 70% of dementia cases. Also, dementia first robs our patient of their ability to remember recent events, even from five minutes ago, but more long-term memories are durable. And you can also say that dementia robs the patient of their moral compass, since they're much less able to regulate the effect that emotions have on their behavior. About 7% of the elderly over 60 will suffer from dementia in their lifetimes. This book compares the dance between the dementia patient and the loved ones who are their caretakers where they seem to have the same arguments over and over again, and the Alzheimer's patients seem to unable to learn from their mistakes. But it is also because, weirdly enough, caregivers experience the same problem. In an uncanny mirroring, the caregivers get pulled into a parallel process with their charges. They forget what happened yesterday repeating what didn't work last time and becoming ever more prone to agitation and impatience, even as we're engaged in a trial of devotion that pushes love to its limit. And we saw the stance in Kim Campbell's excellent biography of the last years of Glenn Campbell, her husband, who suffered from Alzheimer's. Whenever the brain suffers from any type of loss, it has amazing powers of self-healing and rewiring to bypass the problem. This means that the old personality doesn't disappear. Any of this functions in the relationship simply morph into baffling new behaviors. And the patient, until the very end, does not lose the ability to push your buttons. And this is a touching story. The last album Glenn Campbell recorded, including lyrics that explored how frustrating it was to live with Alzheimer's. They asked the doctor, should Glenn embark on a last farewell tour? The doctor encouraged him to tour as long as he was able. Keeping him active would slow down the progress of his dementia, and music often calms the patient. They asked Glenn what would happen if he said or did something embarrassing, how to respond. Glenn simply said, tell everyone I have Alzheimer's, then they'll understand. Like Glenn Campbell, Tony Bennett insisted on touring as long as he could, also cutting a farewell duet album with his good friend Lady Gaga. Rita Hayworth was the first celebrity to admit to an Alzheimer's diagnosis. 
Her daughter is a board member and fundraiser for the Alzheimer's Association. How I first became aware of dementia was when I intervened to stop the foreclosure of a destitute owner so he could be appointed a guardian by the court. The guardian then placed him in a compassionate lockdown facility for Alzheimer's patients and then sold his unit and paid his debts. Now many in the community were fed up with his demented behavior. His only family was an estranged sister. This is all I know. Perhaps they were estranged for decades, but I just could not help but wonder, did his demented behavior also drive her away? When we think of dementia as a disease, we picture it as something that an elderly person catches that makes them different than they were before. When you view dementia in this manner, you tend to assume that their puzzling behavior is totally new behavior. But the overriding theme of this book is that this behavior is not totally new behavior. The baffling behavior is their old irritating behaviors that carry forward and evolve into more extreme forms as the condition progresses. All of us have irritating quirks that irritate those around us. Whatever dysfunctions exist in the relationship between patient and caretaker, especially when the caretaker is a loved one, they become more pronounced and intractable as the disease progresses. We all suffer cognitive decline. Many become more forgetful as they get older. For those of us who have always been forgetful, this transition may be less noticeable. Psychologists have proven that everybody's response time, or time taken to solve puzzles, also known as executive functioning, slows considerably in our retirement age in our 60s and 70s and beyond. What is often new behavior is the anger that many dementia patients feel that often causes them to lash out at their caretakers and those around them. These angry emotions are caused by the frustrations of the disease, or may be caused by the patient not being able to take care of themselves. Maybe they haven't eaten, maybe they're not feeling well, maybe they have a urinary tract infection from not drinking enough, and often they haven't been to the doctor in a while. The author, Dasha Kuyper, notes that the narratives between the patient and the caregiver caused by these dysfunctions can be surprisingly resilient even in the face of neurological damage. The personality and knowledge that forms our self-image is not easily damaged by dementia. What is affected, however, is the ability to update this self-image. This means that the dementia patient remembers himself as he used to be, but he does not remember how he was yesterday or this morning. Often he loses both his short-term memory and his moral compass, guided only by his raw emotions. When his caretaker is a loved one, they remember the patient as they were before, and often become angry at their behavior, forgetting that they are at the mercy of their dementia. They have little control over their behavior, as their emotions now govern their behavior directly. Then the caretakers feel guilty about their anger. Sometimes caregivers blame themselves for not spotting dementia earlier, but, as the author notes, Although clear-cut signs of Alzheimer's, incoherence, sexual inappropriateness, getting lost in familiar places, paranoid delusions, even physical violence, are often present. Family members still hesitate to make the leap to a neurological diagnosis. And these patterns are seen in the first chapter, where Mr. Kessler, the patient, was a survivor of the Nazi concentration camps. And this was a patient whom, early on, the author himself had helped take care of. The traumatic experience of these camps made him obstinate, and he was over-invested in and over-critical of his musician son, Sam. Our author says that Mr. Kessler didn't mind Sam making noise in the house, but playing music was no way of making a living. Sam needed to get a job first and play music second. And as Mr. Kessler's dementia advanced, their roles reversed, and Sam became more demanding, becoming angry in response to his father's needling. And the second chapter described Myla, a dementia patient who lived in poverty in Soviet Russia before moving to America. Myla was obsessed with her possessions, and even before her dementia, she would barge into her daughter Laura's room, demanding that she help her look for her stockings or towels. And the author stated that Myla turned her daughter into a secure base that she had been deprived of. For Myla, the world was a chaotic, scary place, and Laura was her lifeline. As Myla developed dementia, her insecurities worsened, and her behavior became more erratic. In the fourth chapter, we meet Elizabeth and her husband, Mitch. When they were dating, after work, they would meet often in a Greenwich Village restaurant for dinner and a cocktail. They were married, and after many happy years, Mitch developed symptoms of Alzheimer's. He would leave their apartment for the Greenwich restaurant, and Elizabeth would follow him and meet him there, as they did so many years before, like when they were dating, and when dinner was over. She would rush ahead so that she could meet him when he arrived home. But often when he arrived home, he would not know who she was. One time he even called the police to report the supposed intruder. Now in the sixth chapter, we meet Kathy and Frank, who after dementia overtook him, thought every day was Sunday. 
Before he was skeptical, but as his memory began to fail, the prudish rule-bound side of him emerged. Dementia, Kathy said wryly, had brought out his inner Catholic boy. Frank began to fixate on ritual, insisting that they attend church every Sunday. This would have been fine, but for Frank, every day was Sunday. Sometimes she tried to reason with him. She had the priest try to reason with him. But how can you reason with someone who has dementia? Our author notes that sometimes dementia patients compensate for the illness and vulnerabilities with a kind of extreme piety that makes it hard to see the condition. This aggravated Kathy, who thought that this was just his way of showing off, that this was just for show. Unfortunately, as the disease progressed, Frank gradually stopped seeing Kathy as a complete person. She became a prop, a vessel into which he poured his fixations. So while Frank was able to sublimate his internal chaos by turning to ritual, Kathy had no one and nothing to turn to. Instead, she found herself living with a humorless stranger. Some people are like that who don't have dementia. Frank also constantly watched ball games and movies on the television, and he would get really absorbed. Sometimes he'd yell at the ball players, and he would yell at the characters in the movies, and he would shake his fist at the television. This drove Kathy crazy when she went into the bathroom to escape. She even thought about leaving him for a fleeting moment, but snapped out of it and returned to the blaring TV living room. She confided to her author. You know what makes it even worse? She asked. As soon as he saw me, his face broke into a huge smile. God, he's always so happy when he sees me, telling me how much he loves me, even though he barely knows who I am anymore. But I can't bring myself to say it back. What's wrong with me? Shouldn't I want to be with him and take care of him? Frank got worse. He became convinced that thieves were stalking the house, so he locked all the doors and closed all the windows. Kathy lived with this loneliness, caring for Frank's for six long years. And Kathy blamed herself for trying to correct Frank, telling him that today is not Sunday, telling him that Doris Day is not taking anything off, that Clint Eastwood really didn't shoot anybody in real life. And the author reassured her. Her feelings were not her fault. It can be tough caring for someone with dementia, the author notes. Humans are ultra-social and require others to see the world as they do. This need for a shared reality not only creates a connection to others, but also validates feelings, judgments, and sense of self. Without such validation, we become both physically agitated and cognitively uncertain about what we know and how we are. Moreover, this need for a mutually agreed upon reality is so strong that we naturally overestimate the degree to which other people, especially loved ones, share our thoughts and perceptions. So, when a spouse or a parent suddenly sees the world very differently from us, we might intellectually register this as a symptom, but unconsciously feel that an implicit social promise has been broken. We find it difficult to truly believe that loved ones suffering from dementia have lost their free will along with their memory, and that they are hostages to their emotions. And in the seventh chapter, we meet Henry and Ida. They love music. They love novels. Henry was an architect. When she was in her mid-70s, Ida succumbed to Alzheimer's. Ida started talking to the many photographs of family and acquaintances hanging in the hall of their apartment. Then she started talking to the books they owned. The author remembers. As Henry ruefully observed to me during one of our last meetings, I suppose I should be happy that she's happy. She has her books and her pictures. And when I play music for her, she's in heaven. She doesn't really need anything else. But then he fell silent for a moment. But how do I get used to the fact that she has no use for me? Our author concludes, indeed, the more I listen to caregivers and the more I read about the brain, the more it occurred to me that the healthy brain's ingrained biases and proclivities make it unequipped in many ways to deal with a cognitively impaired brain. Because of such neurological restraints, I wanted caregivers to understand it was not character flaws that made caregiving so fraught, but rather their own brain's intrinsic workings. Naturally, I hoped that they would accord themselves the same forgiveness that they're encouraged to offer their patients. My condominium association now actively seeks to assist those dementia patients in our community. But their initial opposition illustrates how difficult it is for people who accept that those who suffer from dementia are not really responsible for their actions, nor are they responsible for the neglect in handling their financial affairs. And now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. And we discussed many, but not all, case studies from the medical practice of Dr. Dasha Piper from this excellent book, Travelers to Unimaginable Lands. This is one of those rare books that's accessible to the layman and useful to the clinician. Please scan the footnotes. He has excellent references to many additional sources and observations. These apply both to dementia in particular and how the brain functions in general. Many tendencies in a normally functioned brains are gradually exaggerated in the compromised dementia brain. One footnote refers to the man who mistook his wife for a hat and other clinical tales from Oliver Sacks. 
Some of these cases are related to dementia, plus other puzzling neurological disorders and their baffling manifestations. These cases often cannot be cured. The family and physician must just simply learn to manage them as best they can. In another footnote, our author is referring to the book Learning to Speak Alzheimer's, and we plan to do a video on these two books in the near future. Another footnote refers to Lawrence Kohlberg, who is an influential psychologist, on the cognitive development approach to socialization. And this work was heavily influenced by the work of Jean Piaget, a prominent development psychologist specializing in the psychology of children. And the particular book he quoted is not readily available, but there's a similar book we found on Amazon that summarizes the views of these two psychologists. In another footnote, Nietzsche touches on how the popular mind is primed to impose intentions even on mindless phenomena, and how language reinforces this tendency in his genealogy of morals in Ecce Homo. And, in my opinion, you should read and study Nietzsche with caution and skepticism. In more footnotes, one type of cognitive reserve is the brain reserve model, where some people have a larger brain with more neurons and synapses, which allows the brain to withstand pathology better, including dementia. Also, we tend to feel and overestimate conscious will when we act and make decisions. This makes sense because our lack of awareness is a defining feature of our unconscious. Also, our brain has been characterized as lazy or fast or frugal, favoring habit over difficult change. More footnotes, we have a tendency to believe that our perception of the world reflects how it actually looks. As a result, we overestimate our accuracy and objectivity. This bias, called naive realism, holds true for our visual perceptions as well as our day-to-day -day world views. And this is especially true for those who value research into conspiracy theories on the internet over credible sources. Also, Benjamin LeBay measured consciousness, role, and behavior. In this much debated study, LeBay did not believe his study showed that there is no free will. And we'll also explore this thought in our review of the book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. And in one long footnote, humans tend to use their knowledge, beliefs, and expertise as a proxy for what others feel and believe, which is a side effect of our natural egocentricity in our perspectives. And one example is a false consensus effect which leads us to think that others share our point of view more than they actually do. The curse of knowledge leads us to overestimate the degree to which people know about something we have learned or are experts in. And this is a tendency that journalists and teachers both fight constantly. And the illusion of transparency leads us to overestimate how many people share in knowing about how we are feeling. In other words, ladies, us men can't read your minds. More footnotes. When dealing with someone's delusions, we sometimes lose patience and cannot resist the urge to correct a delusion when we are tired and in a state of ego depletion. We need self-control when accepting or adjusting to another person's reality because it means overcoming our inherent egocentric perspective. Also, some argue that the reason our brains grew is from the pressures of managing increasingly complex social structures. Our large brains help us to navigate the social world. In other words, it really is challenging to read other people's minds. More footnotes? Our brains are wired to believe or accept things as fact, even when they are nonsense that our mind tries to make sense of. Also, putting yourself in other people's shoes often decreases the accuracy of your perceptions. Rather than trying to imagine what is going on in the head of those with dementia, you should simply ask them directly about their state of mind. However, this is impractical when they are in an advanced state of dementia. I must also mention the excellent website for the Alzheimer's Association at www.alz.org, which we feature in many of our videos on dementia. The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. Please support this channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a very small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, we will host special discussion groups for our patrons. Plus, you can click on the meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.